All right. So we're going to jump in and get started. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, my name is Audrey Bloomer. I'm a paid team lead here in the Philadelphia office at Tier Interactive. And we're going to be walking you through some paid opportunities that um, we've been focused on in 2018, a big focus of data and strategy integration and using those to find efficiencies for your accounts um, and making sure that you're making the most out of your money. So um, Will's been spending a lot of time. He's our founder, CEO, and director of strategy. Um, we've got a lot of great ideas that we're looking forward to sharing with you. So I'm going to pass it over to Will as we're going through the presentation. Um, please feel free to shoot us questions in the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, and as, with that, I'll kick it over to Will. Awesome. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, let me just get my uh, screen up and running here. And uh, let me get into present presenter mode. Can't give you guys all the secrets just yet. And here we go. All right. So, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know how much folks on the call know about me um, or have seen me present, but I, I tend to be brutally honest. And um, one of the things that I've learned in all my years of, of running our agency is that um, as we grew a PPC division, um, you know, a lot of people would come to us, um, you know, saying, hey, I felt that my old agency kind of was good for a couple months when we started and then things went downhill or, um, or I just felt they were getting lazy or they really weren't pushing themselves um, to get any better after those first few months honeymoon phase. And so many of our our, our, our clients today and prospective clients would come to us with this concern around how do I know that's not going to be you? And to be honest with you, I don't think there's a really good answer for that. Um, but I'm hoping that this webinar today gives everybody a little bit of a different way to uh, kind of keep their agencies honest, um, whether it's us or if it's the agency you're using or even your in-house team. So let me get rocking and rolling with that. I'm first going to start just by um, saying, you know, this is this presentation uh, is for folks who are spending significant money on paid. And I think every dollar is significant. Um, I know when we spend money on paid, I, I watch those dollars like a hawk myself. But it's also the people who are thinking things like, <clears throat> man, you know, if I, I could invest in some other thing, I could make another hire, a part-time hire, hire contractors. Um, I could invest in, in voice or I could invest in getting those technical things done if I didn't spend so much on Google ads. Um, I know I've thought that, and I bet a lot of you all have as well. And it's so interesting that this old quote <clears throat> is, is old, and the tools to track advertising have grown so much from the time when this quote was first stated until today. But in all honesty, given the way that we look at big data here at SEER and the way we look at uh, PPC spend, a lot of times this is still happening. Um, and we'll show you examples of it uh, throughout the course of today. You know, the other thing is I think that people realize and they cut some slack, hopefully, to their teams and their agencies, and they go, I understand that there's a certain amount of waste I have to accept because it's impossible to check on every single search term and whether or not it's applicable to my business unless I get into, like, crazy, like, exact match um, to make sure that uh, only certain things are showing up. But then you miss out on all the different ways that people might be searching. So I think that people understand that, but yet it still feels, and we still hear, you know, people feel a little bit like, eh, is my team getting a little lazy on me? Are they just kind of kicking back? And unless I'm the one driving concerns, it seems like they don't really seem to be all that responsive. And you just hear this as a concern time and time and time again. So that's what we really want to help you all to try to get a better grip on today. So let's talk about the five things that we're going to do today. The first thing I'm going to show you are three really quick ways to just get a feel for whether or not somebody's asleep at the wheel. We'll get those done really quick because I understand that there are both um, some smaller business folks on the call and there are some, some very large businesses on the call as well. So I wanted to make sure that everybody walked away with something. The next thing I'm going to talk about and, and illustrate for you all is what I call the small data problem. Um, then we're going to give you some real examples of waste, including some of our own. Um, you know, we run these tools against ourselves and we go, damn, um, we're finding some waste even in our own uh, accounts. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about bias. And I'm going to show you how looking at different data sets and bringing those data sets together can eliminate the bias that we all bring to every account that we work on. 
And the last thing I'll talk about is our uh, is a landing page issue that um, I don't think anybody's really talking about, but I think could save us all a lot of money. So with that said, I have one warning. Um, I am quote unquote an SEO guy. I spent most of my time on SEO. Um, and I, you know, I have a lot more to learn about PPC, but just learning small bits about the, the levers that PPC or other divisions can pull and the data that they have at their fingertips eventually led me to doing um, larger and larger data in Excel and then in the Power BI, which is my tool of choice. But I also want to remind people, I'm a CEO. And every dollar that I waste on a, on, a, on, a, on a click that had nothing to do with my business is another dollar that I can't donate into our community to help uh, organizations that we care about as a company. It's another dollar that I can't use for raises and bonuses or to invest in innovation. So while I am also a marketer, um, I am also a CEO who spends money on paid and has to make some tough calls about where my money goes. And sometimes I wish I didn't have to make those calls. And I think today we're going to free up some budget to help you all not have to make those calls. And the way that I got here was uh, kind of from this quote. Um, and, you know, it's about the concept of I stopped staying deep in my area of expertise. Um, I had gotten pretty good at SEO and I feel pretty strong about my capabilities there, but I really didn't know much about paid. So instead of me going deeper and deeper in that area of expertise, um, I decided to innovate by diverging from the data that the, the silo that I lived in. I said, well, how would I do my job better as an SEO? If I had to use paid data to help me figure out what keywords to target, if I had to use analytics data or census data or other data that wasn't what typical SEOs would use, you know, link data, technical data, screaming frog, et cetera, we all use that. I said, how could I do those jobs better with other data sources? And that's what led me to today. And let me talk to you a little bit about how the conversation I believe will be changing um, and like how we even talk about negatives and how to save clients money. So, you know, when I first kind of looked at, our, our, at ourselves and myself and I said, hey, if I'm going to do a negative analysis and I pull my data down into Excel, you know, I'm going to pull the top 10,000 search terms because that's manageable. And I might say I only want the top 10,000 search terms that I've spent over $100 this year. But at SEER, the narrative that I'm trying to push today sounds more like this. I pulled every search term you've bid on in the last three years. You spent money on 1.6 million search terms. Then I married those search terms with the top 100 rankings for each one of those 1.6 million terms. Then I pulled all the snippets and the local results and the related searches, and I brought all that into our data warehouse. And then because I looked at so many keywords and so many unique URLs and rankings, I'm also categorizing all those domains to help you, client X, find waste. And what's really cool is that I'll show you exactly how some of that's done today. So like I said, my tool of choice is Power BI, um, but you could use Tableau, Looker, or any of those other tools and create similar types of visuals. For this one client, we looked at uh, their data and we realized that 96.7% of all their search terms in the last three years never drove or assisted a conversion. That's not a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, don't uh, save judgment. There's a lot of reasons why this happens. What was more interesting though is that 2.74% of all of the search terms that it ever converted had only driven between 0.1 and assist to one conversion. Now, once I excluded that big set of keywords that had never, or search terms that had never converted, I realized that my largest set of search terms, 83% of all of the search terms that got a conversion were in this 0.1 to one conversions for the entire time frame. So most of those big converting words actually weren't necessarily the, there was, there was fewer of them, let's just put it that way, um, than there were of this kind of long tail of converting keywords. Another way that I've seen people uh, choose to filter their data is to say, oh, let me sort only by keywords that I spent, um, you know, over $100 all year. Well, for this one client, we would have missed out on 99.09% .09 of all of the search terms that they had spent money on. So the idea of filtering down your data can actually cause you to miss large chunks of spend. For this, uh, for in this example, uh, what I'm showing here uh, is that my overall number of conversions and clicks are at the top. But then when I click on this little donut down here that says less than $100, so these are for search terms that we spent less than $100 on, you can see this, 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 this donut comprises about 30% of my conversions, 
a little less than half of all my clicks. It's like 99 point something percent of all my search terms and about, you know, 30 something percent of my overall spend. So when we filter our data down to look at a smaller data set, can you imagine you're basically looking at, you know, 38% of your spend you just aren't even looking at because they're only getting one to nine clicks. But yet when I went to my uh, search terms that spent over a certain number, in this instance, over $2,500, you can see how much smaller the number of search terms get, but the spend conversions clicks, eh, you know, they're not as, they're not as big of a discrepancy. So I show you this to show you that there are real, real spends happening and real conversions happening on these really, really long tail search terms. But that's a little bit advanced and I wanna make sure that I uh, give you all some of my kind of quick hitters. Some of these might be a little controversial. A lot of my team members didn't necessarily like them, um, but I know when I put my CEO hat on and not my search marketer hat on, I wish I had known this in the early, early days when I was uh, trusting consultants to help me with my, my business. So let's go. The first thing I've got for you is if you've only got five minutes, to do anything to check up on your agency. And this will not work for a lot of larger agencies, but it'll work for a good amount. Change your password. Um, I didn't come up with this one on my own. Uh, a client of ours came to us, had changed their password. They waited 30 days before the agency, uh, wait, no, they, they changed their password and waited 30 days to see if their agency at the time would ever catch the fact that their password was changed. They never did. And then they fired that agency and then picked us. Um, that was nine years ago before everybody was in MCCs. Uh, but the concept of saying, I got a full invoice for the month, but yet there's no way you've been able to make any changes because you literally aren't able to log into the account is, um, is telling. And this wasn't a little small mom and pop. It's a client who, when I Googled them, uh, they did just a hair under 500 million in revenue last year. Um, so, uh, you know, that's one thing that, uh, that you can do. Now I know that if you know people are in MCCs and uh, my client center and things like that of that nature, you may or may not be able to. Um, hold on one second. Let me just check a little chat I got here. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, like someone said, yeah, great. If you're using an MCC, it won't work. Um, I I I, uh, I actually tweeted out a poll and found that. Um, I think it was about 52 or 53 percent of all agency folks um, have 100 percent of their clients in their MCC, which meant that you know there are still opportunities out there uh, in the MC, even though they're uh, uh, not everyone's in an MCC. It's just my 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 point there. Um, so my next thing is if you got 30 minutes uh, to spend and you want to do this once a month, looking at your change history is another way to look at. Uh, you know, an agency and what kind of acti activities they're doing on the account. So what's really cool is that you can log in, check your change history. I think that we'll uh, get a video out to everybody at some point um, after this call that can kind of show you um, how to go about checking your change history. So you can see, are they in there adjusting bids? Are they building new ads? Are they changing, um, you know, keywords and things of that nature? Just to know, hey, is somebody watching what's going on on my account or is it in kind of a set it and forget it mode? Another disclaimer, automation tools can easily change bids and whatnot for you too. So, um, you know, this isn't a hundred percent, but you know what, when it's my money, I want to know somebody's actually putting in some work. And uh, if there's other uh, ways that people can think of that are easy for some of our uh, smaller and mid-sized businesses to kind of check up on their agencies, feel free to contact us afterwards. We'd love to be able to share those things after the, after the webinar. Third thing, this takes about 30 minutes. My team did not like this um, very much either. But again, this is my money I'm spending on PPC. I want to make sure I'm getting the biggest bang for my buck. And if you have a page that's 404 or your 404, your, uh, your landing page, um, Google's going to let you continue to get clicks in that from what I've seen. Um, so if you 404 to page, how long would it take for your team to find out that they're getting, that they're spending your money on a page that doesn't even exist now? That's a little risky. My team went, hey, Will, you know, that's a, that's a bit extreme. Uh, I, would, I would agree. Um, I'm, I'm an extreme guy. Uh, but the other thing you can do, ask your agency to send you a screen capture of their broken link scripts to check all of your pages. So there are scripts out there, and we'll be sending you a link that will have a, the, the links out to these, these scripts that you can use to kind of check your URLs and make sure they're, they're not broken. I mean, it's kind of sad that Google will let you continue to get clicks on 
on ads with broken landing pages. Um, so if, if they're not checking that, how are they going to find out that that's the issue that you have? And like I said, um, we've written about scripts in, in, in detail, so we will share that with you later. The next thing I said that we would talk a little, bit, a little bit about today is filtering your data down into smaller data sets and how that can be a big risk. I think I kind of touched on this earlier, but I'm just going to reiterate some of the points again here, which is when you say I'm only going to analyze search terms with greater than 10 clicks this year, which I filtered right here in Power BI, um, you know, it only represented 2.6% of all my search terms for this client. Now it did represent 68% of spend, but think about it, we're back to that third. Um, we're about, you know, I'm seeing typically about 30% um, of most of our clients have a significant spend on words that are getting very, very low clicks and or um, costs. So we know that one way people sort their data is by clicks to kind of get the data set down a little bit smaller, and you could be ignoring a significant chunk of conversions and cost. But what you're also missing is, you know, for that one client, it's $237,000 is spent on search terms that have less than 10 clicks all year. Um, that's 97% of all their search terms and 33% of their whole budget. That's a chunk. And I think that what we need to do is, is find how can we get better at kind of digging through that long, long, long tail in a way that scales and uh, doesn't require us to sit there looking at 50, 60,000 millions of individual keywords. The other thing I've seen people do is they've said, oh, I'm going to cut my data down to keywords that only spent over, or search terms that only spent over $10 all year. So let's go ahead and do that. And for this client, I would be ignoring 87.8% .8 of all their search terms and 20% of all of their spend. And again, down in this area, 20% of your overall marketing budget, or at least your paid budget, for most people is pretty substantial. And I think that agencies owe it to their clients to figure out a better way to, to, to kind of scale uh, quality of that long tail. So now let me show you some examples of what this looks like in the wild. So let's give you some real world examples. Uh, for those of you that are not big hip hop fans, this is 21 Savage. Um, about 18 months ago, he dropped a song called Bank Account. And I caught it and I said, oh, this is interesting. Um, the whole first page of Google, when you search for the word bank account, with the exception of Bank of America, Bank of America about, when I showed this last time, was about eight months ago. Bank of America was the only bank on the first page of Google for the word bank account. And it was because this song dropped and, all, and Google said, hey, most of the people searching for bank account, they're looking for things related to 21 Savage. And even today, when you search for bank account, at least when I put the screen craps together for this presentation, I could see that 21 Savage is the number one result with that big video snippet for the word bank account. And look at all the banks showing up right above it. You know, even if you look at like Santander, for instance, you know, I don't know if I would want to be the fourth position right above a video where somebody can click anywhere in that video and start playing it because it might lead you to some accidental clicks. Now, a lot of times people get defensive when we talk about this, you know, um, but I will tell you, if I had to make a bet and I've actually worked with a banking client who they found themselves in seven weeks, I think they had spent like $30,000 on 21 Savage keywords related to bank account. And they caught it. Their agency never caught that all of a sudden the world had changed and there were very different results showing up and that they were bidding on all kinds of different words. Um, and I would say, since I've actually seen the paid search data and the spend on these words, it wouldn't surprise me if we don't see three to $5 million spent by banks since that song has dropped on words that just include bank account and lyrics, video, MP3, Savage, et cetera. So a lot of times what happens when we look at these overall kind of high level metrics is you're like, well, I'm beating, I'm beating my ROAS goal. I'm in a good position. I would question that um, because just because you're beating your goal doesn't mean we should continue to just to accept that there's, bad clicks in our accounts. We gotta hold ourselves to a bigger account and a stronger account than that. So when I look at the word bank account song release date, this has nothing to do with banks, yet banks are showing up. And I'm telling you because I've seen the data. If you don't believe that people don't click on these results when they're looking for hip hop videos, then uh, <laughs> um, there's tens of thousands of dollars waiting to be reclaimed from, uh, from, uh, from your account if you're in the banking sector, just trust me on this. 
when I search for lyrics, I see M&T Bank. When I search for 21 Savage Video, here we are, PNC, Chase, Santander, and I know that these kind of words are getting clicks and wasting money. So I don't need to belabor that point anymore. Go do your own searches. You will see that banks are consistently showing up for these. And I would say on the mobile, uh, I'd be really, really careful with accidental clicks um, on my PPC results. I'll just leave it at that. All right, so I think that that's hard to defend. So just because your ROAS is at the right, is, in the, is, is overall in a good position, it's hard to defend against why I as a bank would want to show up for a hip hop song plus the word MP3. Now the good part um, about looking at big data across the massive data set is that Sears is able to kind of proactively preempt this. Um, anything that we find that's kind of a, oh, this is happening in this sector, we're able to kind of look at it across all clients um, that are in our, uh, in our data warehouse. And I'm telling you that this happens on every single account. You know, um, so my goal today is to help you find these things. And I think that you find these things by enriching your PPC data with data from other sources. Just give me one second here. All right. So when you look at those data from other sources, uh, you know, the question is, is how do you find the 21 savages of the world at scale? How do you find them at scale? Because I listen to this music. You might not. So you might not be searching for the word bank account looking for a song when it drops. And I think that as marketers, all of us, all of us need to be working on how we minimize our own bias. Every time we see a keyword, we bring a bias to that about what we believe it is, but we can't know what that word means for everyone. Even when you look at things like the Google Display Network, um, and we're going to be working on this later today, I just got a list of, I think, a couple million URLs um, that I'll be digging through today, but I'm going to show you what I'm doing uh, on, a, on a smaller level. So let's say you've got 100,000 different domains that have shown up on the GDN. How do you evaluate all of them in a way that enables you to feel kind of confident that you can uh, eliminate some of the ones that aren't so great? Of course, there's the typical metric spend, clicks, conversions, things of that nature that you're already getting. But what happens when you break out of your silo and say, hey, I'm going to go use an SEO metric to because SEOs all day are trying to evaluate the value of a domain, right? Because they're out there building links and things like that. And they need to know that this domain has a higher value than that domain. So one of the things that one of our uh, coworkers just showed me yesterday, so thank you, Christina Mir, for putting this together, is how she used domain authority from Moz, which is an SEO metric, and overlaid it on, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of different domains uh, that had shown up uh, in, a, in a placement analysis. And then what we're able to do is start to have a, a hypothesis around, hey, you know what, if my domain authority is less than 30, uh, then I believe that those sites are more than likely not going to be as worthwhile as some other sites. So then for this client, what we could do is we could add up all that spend and say, hey, you know what, we're going to do an evaluation on about $10,000 worth of spend on sites that Google sees as, uh, as, or not Google, sorry, Moz, trying to track against Google, see as low quality domains. And if I ran this for the rest of the domains, because it, it kind of timed out before I could finish it for this presentation, I would have had this run for 188,000 different domains. And we could easily kind of pick off anything below a certain quality level. Maybe we don't want to spend on those until we can do a little bit more of an analysis. So this is what happens when uh, someone in your company or in your organization or your agency is literally uh, coming from two different worlds, and they're trying to combine the data from one world into the data of another. And once you start doing that, I think it creates so much opportunity to find inefficiencies and waste. We have a tool that we've built out. Um, it's in Super Super Alpha. Uh, we, we, we call it Saving Ben, and it's built to basically run automatically on all the clients in our MCC so that we will automatically find these kinds of discrepancies because we just don't want to see us um, or any of our clients kind of getting these kind of small click keywords that are still draining um, parts of their budgets. It's just not, a, it's just not cool. So marketer bias, um, you know, I think the problem is it makes you poorer, right? It drains your budgets. So like that 21 Savage example. It drains your budgets. Um, you're getting a lot of clicks. You're spending money on it. 
uh, but the only person getting making making any money off of your not knowing that the world has changed is Google. Um, and that's why we have to figure out how to minimize our bias. Because personally, my love of hip hop makes me a much better waste detective in banking PPC. Why? Because rappers love to talk about money. So therefore, if it's 21 Savage talking about bank account, and this is 21 Savage walking around with a whole lot of money not in a bank account, surprise, surprise. Um, uh -huh. And this is Dram. And you know, if you're a hip hop fan, you're like, oh, wait a second. Dram has a really popular song called Cash Machine. And I will tell you, if you Google Cash Machine, the most of the results on the first page of Google are going to be around Dram's song. But yet there are people um, bidding on PLAs. And if you go to the second page, you will see people bidding on things in PPC around cash machine as if you wanted to actually buy a cash machine. So the question really is, how do you kind of get rid of that bias? Because for instance, I am not an undocumented, uh, I guess you can't call it an undocumented citizen, um, but I am a documented citizen of the United States that actually um, would leave me to not have empathy entirely for certain types of searches people might do in the banking sector. And what we found for one of our clients through our tool called Saving Ben, let me just move this one thing here, is that there, was, there were people searching for words related to undocumented and savings account, undocumented and bank account. And there was legitimate money being spent on these words, but my client doesn't offer, uh, actually it's not, a, it's an SEO client, not a PPC client, but, um, but my client doesn't offer bank accounts for people that are undocumented um, or are, uh, are immigrants, um, specifically looking for things related to undocumented. So you have to stop and take a look at all these different ads here. And there could be a bunch of different reasons why these ads are showing and different targeting reasons why they're showing. But that seems like a lot of advertisers showing up for regular checking accounts or bank accounts when in actuality, uh, you know, they're probably not going to be able to service the people that are searching for them. And these, again, are those kind of words that are getting five or 10 clicks in a month um, that add up in the aggregate that you need to find a way to find to save yourself that money. All right. Another thing that St. Be uh, Benjamin, that's a brewery here in Philly. Um, another thing that Saving Benjamin caught is, um, is differences in word meaning. And the word deck plan, I want everybody right now to just stop and think, when you think of the word deck plan, what does that mean to you, what are you envisioning? Now, let me show you uh, what we learned through our through our tool, kind of bringing this to our attention. So, when I think a deck plan, I think like, oh, like you're probably looking for a plan to build a deck. And I would imagine that many of you are probably thinking the same thing. And you'd be right. For you, if you want to build a plan for a deck. Something like this, which looks amazing. If anybody on the call has a deck like this, please uh, invite me over. I'd love to come by and hang out. Um, but this is what we were thinking, right? But yet, our tool caught something in the cruise ship space. And we went, what? Holy ship. What is going on here? People search for deck plans when they are getting ready to go on a cruise ship. Now, this is the kind of thing, folks, that if you don't have a tool that's kind of running, uh, running these analyses for you and finding these things, you may not know that some of the words you're bidding on have different meanings, whether it's 21 Savage and, and, and bank account or DRAM and cash machine or this instance where Norwegian Pearl is a deck with a, uh, is showing cruise deck plans. Um, so what we do at SEER is we go, great, let me just Google cruise ship list. I get a list of every cruise ship uh, in the world and we scrape out all these different cruise ship names and we negate all of them because that's not what we wanted to show up for. Um, and now you might look at like a Carnival Vista cruise line. And I'll tell you, when I searched for Carnival Vista, the third most popular search term included the word deck plans. So you have to look at these different words that are kind of off of uh, the core word and say, hey, are some of these not what I should be targeting? So if you said, hey, I'll just negate Carnival and I'll be good, right? 
wrong because carnival is not in the word Dawn Princess. So if I search for Dawn Princess, which isn't even a live uh, cruise ship anymore, I think it's been either rebranded or, or retired, um, deck plan is another thing that people search for. So you can kind of see that this concept of, oh, I thought deck plan meant one thing in the same way that you might have thought that, uh, you know, bank account meant one thing or that cash machine meant one thing. Your search terms are rife with these kinds of examples, but I find that because the click volumes are low, it's been very, very hard for people to find a way to get rid of this kind of waste. But you know what? I don't think it's just a technology problem. I think this happens because it's a people problem and an incentive problem. So on the people side, People want to be, get really good at their jobs in, in search, right? So if you're a PPC marketer, you're trying to learn how to get really good at PPC. And that's, you know, that's not easy. It's, it's a tough job. So then you may not necessarily go over and try to also learn SEO because how can you be that great at both of them? It's very, very difficult. And I, as an SEO, spent 16, 17 years of my career trying to get better at SEO. And it took me the last two years to go, well, let me look over here on the, on the PPC side, see what's going on and see if I can learn something there. So people inherently don't want to break out of their silos or break out of their area of expertise. But the incentives is also a really big point as well. And to be honest with you, this is a little bit sad about the state of agencies, but it's true. Um, you know, if, if an agency innovation, so what I'm showing you all today is, is one of our agency's innovations. If that results in lower client spend, then the agency makes less money. And, and that's where our incentives are misaligned. And that's why a lot of clients are skeptical of, of agencies. Now, I hope that at least this webinar shows that Sears not in the business of trying to have you spend more money if it's not working for you. And you have to think, I'm the CEO of this business. I founded this business. Um, if anybody is waking up in the morning thinking about how to grow this business and make more money for SEER, it would be me, right? But I think that the way that we grow our business and maintain our reputation in the space and build trust with our clients is to help them eliminate waste on the hopes that they go, man, like, you know what? Our incentives I thought were misaligned, but the fact that you all are investing this much time and money and finding a way to save us money, which is going to make us spend less with you um, and probably lower your fees with us, hopefully those kind of things build trust within our agency clients. But I will tell you, I think that one of the reasons why um, you haven't seen a tool like this built um, uh, or that you don't see a lot of agencies doing this kind of work is because anything that results in you spending less if you're a client typically doesn't get rewarded by the CEO of those types of agencies. That's why I think that's some bull. Um, so if you're interested in saving Ben, um, at the end of the webinar, we will have uh, like the super pre-alpha sign up. Um, if you're interested, if you think some of this might be happening to you, we have ways of, um, of, of, of starting to help you uncover some of this stuff. But you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not here to point fingers at other people. This happens to us too. Um, so I'm gonna go through one of our campaigns. So we were bidding for ourselves. Um, we are uh, Google Analytics um, a premium partner um, and our premium reseller rather and uh, so we started going after 360 words and Google Analytics words and Google Analytics support words and oh ooh, phone number I don't think we want to be paying money for those clicks and then I looked at my own brand and I went man look at all these seer rating words like what's that all about like, and the number the cost total might be low but you know what like that's my money i don't want to just give it to google so it's like oh man the matching on that in some way shape or form is off and you can see one of the ways that i find these is i take my search terms out of ppc and i um run a ranking analysis on all of them and i can see wherever we're not ranked well 105 105 105 there's a good chance that that's not related to my business at all and i could have saved a lot of money that way if i had have run it even earlier E-commerce tracking, yay! We wanna help e-commerce businesses better do e-commerce tracking. And, and uh, no, people are typing in DHL or UPS in front of the word e-commerce tracking and I'm paying money for that. But the way that we surfaced it is we were able to say, show me the words where we don't rank at all or where we rank over 100. That includes certain words that we're spending money on. And that's how you start to catch these little one-off spends. Here's another interesting one strategy and analytics yeah we want to talk about clients that uh, we want to talk to clients who are looking to develop more strategy around their analytics work um seems like it makes sense right until you find out that there's a company called strategy analytics and i spent 309 dollars 
uh, going after words related to that company's name and some other words that you might see here. What I will tell you is there's none of those people are going to become uh, seer clients more than likely, but I had to spend money here, 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 and here to find that out. And if you just look at those numbers and add them up, I'm already close to a thousand bucks. And it probably took me, I think when I did this, it took me like 15 minutes to find that thousand dollars in waste. But then there's other things to be looking for, like the word cost. So a lot of people want to know, well, how much does Google Analytics 360 cost? And we were targeting that word and we spent real money on that. And we got a couple conversions. So, you know, all right, fine. We spent real money on paid. And then around pricing words, we spent real money on that too. And the thing is, when you start combining different data sets from different silos, you start to see things like this. Hey, well, if people want to know how much it costs and Google's giving that answer as an answer right here, do I really want to be spending my hard earned dollars? Again, like this isn't just a client spending money. This is my money, right? And, you know, that's $8,000 in spend. I could have bought lunch for the whole team for a week probably with $8,000 that would never have turned into anything for me or turned into business. So we're gonna see if those uh, couple of clicks with our closed loop that converted, if they actually were serious conversions or not, because if the answer is already here in front of you, I'm not sure that the PPC value for me is worth spending that much money to get in front of somebody with a landing page that doesn't have the pricing on it when the answer is sitting right here in front of them which leads me to the next thing, which is around landing pages. And I think this is one of the more interesting analyses that I've ever done. So hopefully uh, it'll, um, it'll, it'll be of interest to you all as well. So often we beg and beg and beg for new landing pages and paid and they're, and they're sometimes not always produced. And when I put data to it, I, looked, I was able to bring data to why we need more landing pages to our clients. So what I do is I create a little, uh, uh, a little visual here on the top left, and each um, color represents a, 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 a URL, a landing page URL. And when I click on that home page, for instance, you'll see down here at the bottom that I've got, okay, so my number of unique URLs for PPC, how many conversions I drove to that landing page. You can also see um, unique URLs and unique search terms. So. What this is telling you is that for one landing page in paid, this client matched to 13,762 unique search terms. And that that one landing page is driving, that homepage is driving 48% of all their conversions. But when you look at those same 13,762 words, Google has 4,032 unique number one ranking URLs. So let me just slow down there and reiterate what I'm telling you. For 13,762 unique search queries, the, this client's paid team is driving all 13,762 unique queries to one PPC landing page. Yet, when we look at, for those same 13,762 words, when I look at who ranks or what URL ranks number one for all 13,762, there were 4,302 unique pages ranking in the number one spot. So when you start finding these discrepancies, it enables you to go back to your client and say, how could we have one page to answer 13,000 queries, whereas when you have to earn that ranking, Google has 4,302 unique landing pages or, or URLs ranking for it. And it just helps you to put a more data-driven perspective to why, um, why you might need more landing pages to help you better connect with what customers are searching for. And the thing that I like the most about what I just showed there when I, when I get a chance to present it to a client is that is a fact. That's not my opinion that like at nothing you see here or here is opinion driven. I have, I have it all blurred out, but every one of those URLs I can click on and see um, how many conversions went to it, how many unique uh, URLs are ranking for the same words that that landing page is ranking for. On the right hand side, I've got each individual search term, how many clicks uh, the client got, how much they spent on that, and whether or not it converted. 
I also have where these sites are ranking, if they're ranking one, two, three, four, those are all facts. So therefore it brings less, I believe you should do based on my 18 years of experience in search and more the data is telling us. And it's a different way of speaking even about your hypotheses. And it's something that I'm asking our clients to even challenge us more and more on is to say, hey, show me the data that led you to the thing that you just said, right? Because I think all companies that say they're quote unquote data driven have to be okay being challenged for what data did you get to bring you to the conclusions that you are telling me. And the thing is that I haven't also seen when I did this analysis, I started combining my organic data to look at things like, and I'll use our own data in this example, for the word Google Analytics Salesforce integration. It's something that we like to do a lot of here at SEER. Our PPC landing page was driving people to this landing page experience, which is fine. It got us, it did get us some leads. However, our organic content ranks number three for that phrase. Now look at the difference between these two pages. This one and this one. The beauty is, is inside of Power BI, I was able to say, show me all my, um, all my uh, uh, instances where my quality score is between one and three, so lower quality score, that include the word sales, because I was looking for Salesforce, and then I've got my ranking sitting right here. So now I can start to see keywords that I'm bidding on, or in this instance, search terms, that I bid on, where I already rank on the first page of Google and I'm able to bring in the URL that is telling me, well, Google's already rewarded you with this URL. So maybe you should test, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't change this. I'm saying maybe you would just test trying the organic URL that's ranking with a slightly more aggressive call to action because there is something to be learned for having a stronger call to action on a page like this than this. But it's also interesting that we've already earned a top ranking for many of these words that we're willing to spend money on. So maybe we should give that a test. And that's what happens when you kind of join your data sets together. To take it even a step further, for one of our clients, we looked at uh, a homepage that was getting a ton, a ton, a ton of keywords. And we were able to say, hey, for words related to durable, which is an adjective that people are using to describe the product, your homepage doesn't have the word or the page you're landing people on doesn't even use the word that people are using in their search phrase. And it enables you to try to catch these at scale to create better landing page experiences for your customers. Now, of course, this just means you got to figure out how can I produce more landing pages? What does it cost for me to produce one and get one up? But if you can get that cost down, you can start to build more landing pages, which I think will help you get better quality scores and probably save you a little bit of money too. And the last thing I've got for you is domain classification. So sometimes when we're pulling down a million different domains or five million domains, um, you know, I, I don't want to look at that. And I don't want to hire anybody at SEER to have to look at all of those. So what we like to do is use a domain classifier. Um, and that domain classifier uses some machine learning and a bunch of stuff that I don't understand. But what it does is for a client in a certain vertical, I could say, hey, well, I can click on shopping. And I can say, well, show me all the instances where I'm bidding on words that include shopping. And you can see something like chewing toys for children with brain injuries, okay? Um, but if my client is in the hospital space, it's like, well, they're not e-com. So anywhere they're shopping could be a scent for me for words to potentially negate or, um, or words where there might be some waste in, in, in spend. So then I can do a drill down inside of Power BI and I can look for different types of brands that are categorized under shopping in the domains. And I go, okay, well, there's eBay and there's Ikea and whatnot. And I can say, okay, well, hmm, where am I showing up for words where Google believes that Ikea is a good answer when I am in the healthcare space? And that will also lead you to keywords that are potentially easy to negate. And I will show you that one of the biggest finds that I found, um, and this happens in a couple of different verticals, is people one of the categories is homework and study tips. And I went, why is my client showing up for homework and study tips as a category for keywords that, 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 the, cat, that the domain classifier believes are around homework? And let me show you. People are looking for test answers. And what's crazy is that when you're looking for test answers, you're not looking for a healthcare provider. So it's like you're taking a test. So the idea that, oh, well, if somebody's searching for a test question, they wouldn't click on my, um, on my PPC ads, wrong. 
here's the data. And the data is proving that people do surprisingly click on stuff that they don't even really want or that will never answer their question. For my friends in the banking space that have stayed on through this whole 46 minutes so far, this is insane. Remember when you were a kid and you were trying to cheat, or maybe you weren't trying to cheat, um, but you were trying to, uh, you were getting uh, homework questions, and it would be like, Amy deposited $35 in her bank account, and then she wrote a check for, yeah, yeah, you Google that these days. These, these kids today, they Google the questions to these, and then they, uh, they get the answers and fill it in. And while that's sad, and we can talk about that in a, on another day, it's sad that my client is unfortunately getting one off and two off and three clicks here and there in a month where people are not looking for what they have to offer. So finding these domain categories and using that domain classifier to find things at scale gives you a whole new way to look through millions and millions of domains looking for things that might not add up. Okay, so let's start trying to get to the q and I know there's some questions there, start typing them in, but Let's just reiterate what, we're, what you're going to see next. I know I kind of fire hosed you. Um, you will get a recording of the webinar um, before the end of the day today. Um, it will include things like the, uh, the link out to our uh, scripts uh, asset that we have on our site so you know um, how to get more of those scripts in place or to even ask your agency, hey, have you used some of these scripts to help save me money when I have broken links and things like that? And also, if you have Q&A questions, go ahead and start putting them in now so we can try to get to as many of them as possible. I'll do the best that I can to answer them. We're also going to send you videos, uh, apologies for the fire truck going through. Um, we're also going to send you videos on how to actually step-by-step -step do this stuff yourself. Um, we have some videos on YouTube already, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel because I think that we're really trying to pioneer this concept of using data across silos and big data to help people find waste. And I don't mind sharing that with all of you. I don't care if you go do this yourself or if you hire Sear to help you, but I don't think that we need to give uh, you know, the Google team any more money. Uh, so uh, the video will show you how we found 3K in potential wasted spend for Sear um, and 61K in waste for an IT client. Um, it'll also give you an opportunity to sign up uh, for super early beta access or alpha access to Saving Ben. Um, it's not going to come for a couple more uh, months, but if you want to get on that list and be somebody that helps us kind of test it out and give us feedback, we would love to figure out a way to make it better so we can provide it to more and more companies to save them more and more money. Because haven't we all given Google enough money already? I don't feel we need to give them any more with the with the deck plans and the 21 savages of the world. So with that said, I'm ready to turn it back over to Audrey for the last 10 minutes or so for us to do Q and A. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. Thanks, Will. I am working on sharing my video. And maybe not, okay. Cool, so we have a couple questions that I will tee up for you. So the first one is, um, do you use a tool to scrape data like the cruise ship names from a website? If so, what tool? If not, how do you do it? Ah, okay. So, um, Madison, um, the, that, that, the, that's, an, that's an easy one, kind of. Um, in this instance, is uh, I just Googled it, and I looked for um, Wikipedia. And um, Wikipedia is really easy to scrape. So I just did a custom scrape. Um, off of Wikipedia to say, let me bring in all those names. Um, there's a tool, and somebody might remember it. Um, there's a Chrome plugin that does, there's a couple Chrome plugins that do scraping really well. Um, for those of you that are super advanced or want to be super advanced, um, Power BI has um, web, uh, create an example data set from a website. So you can actually go into Power BI and um, use web by example as your data source. And you'll say, oh, I want this, this, and that from the web page. And it'll go through and scrape it all and put it right into a table for you so you can join that data with all your paid data as well. Awesome. A similar question on what ranking analysis tool are you using? Oh, um, we use a bunch. Um, my, my favorite right now um, is stat, um, getstat.com. Um, but we're also using uh, Authority Labs. We've looked at um, Cert Monitor. There's a bunch of different ones out there. But uh, really, for me, it's mostly stat and Authority Labs are the two that we use the most. All right, next question. How can we make better optimizations when Google is sharing less information every time, like the new responsive ads or the search term report? 
so I don't have a great answer for this. Um, Audrey, um, you're a little closer to PPC than I am and integration, so why don't you take it? Cool. So for this is a really good question. I think a lot of what we're trying to do um, and why we're thinking about data integration is we're trying to be more intelligent with the recommendations that we're making because we are starting to rely on Google to be a little bit smarter with responsive ads. For those of you that don't know is when Google is able to mash up headlines and description lines and serve the best variation over time based on the machine learning. So what we're doing as marketers is understanding, like Will said, what's on the SERP, um, what is the intent behind a search query, what are people asking, what questions is Google providing, so then we can inform better ad copy and better user experience, the same with landing pages. So um, we're trying to think outside of the Google machine learning budget bubble to be a little bit more intelligent with our, with our optimization. Um, and we can always connect offline if you have uh, deeper questions on that. Um, so the next question would be, um, in terms of creating ad copies, what are your top two go-to techniques for effective copy? Um, so that's something I can take as well. <laughs> so in a similar light, um, effective, what we find is audience research. So a huge part of everything that we do is audience first um, and strategy integration. So understanding the pain points of the audience um, between audience interviews, uh, scouring online reviews, looking at content that is on their website and what are those uh, unique value props that they're pushing. Um, so our top two go-to techniques would definitely be um, connecting outside data source and uh, our understanding of what's important to the business. Um, and then looking at any historical content um, that may or may not have been running in the past in terms of call to action. Um, all right. so. Uh, this is an easy one. Are there going to be more videos about joining different data sets with Power BI? Hell yeah. Like, we play well with others. We are trying the best that we can to go across silos of data. Um, you know, we've got people that have played with census data, um, trying to join that into Power BI to see what we can learn. We're currently calculating distance from our client's headquarters to um, comparing to their competitors and how far that distance is and the latitude and longitudes are. So we just keep banging and banging on this stuff. And our, you know, our style, if you know anything about SEER, our style is to share what we've learned with the community. So if we learn something that we think is valuable, we'll always share it on our YouTube channel and teach you all how to do it for yourselves if you want to. Cool. Um, this next question is, thanks for this webinar. Is there a percentage of spend that you'd say is the price of admission for PPC spend, especially when you're trying to allow Google to find additional long-term queries that are profitable? 1%, 0.1%, et cetera. Okay, so I have one uh, approach to that. Um, Audrey, you might have another, so feel free to jump in. Um, it is what I love about this tool saving bend that we built is there's a fear of going for a keyword broad or, or, or a phrase and being like, I'm going to get matched to so much stuff that like, how am I going to look through all these words to find the 10% or the 5% that are worth it? With a tool like Saving Ben, what we can do is we can fire up a, a broad match term and then within a week, shut that down, run the analysis and say, these words were the right types of intent. These other 90% were the wrong intent. So now you start finding these pockets um, at scale versus having to kind of sit there and go, oh, I'm afraid to go after these words because it's going to take me so long to bid on them and to get any data and then to look through that data that the juice may not be worth the squeeze. Yeah, and I would agree with those points too. In terms of the price of admission, it's really just gonna be variable depending on your goals and what you're trying to achieve. One other way outside of Saving Benjamin that we can do this um, to kind of lower that price of admission um, is dynamic search ads, so DFA um, is a good low barrier to entry that's usually pretty effective um, in terms of CPCs and driving relevant traffic. Um, so I would definitely recommend looking into that. And then um, we don't have a percentage per se, but it's kind of what you would be most comfortable with. Um, okay, so let's see. The next question comes, um, what are some strategies to deal with our bias in search terms? Um, I think that to be honest with you, the first thing, uh, Nicole, is just to be aware, I mean, I know it sounds like really soft and all that, but like be aware that you might see a word in one lens and somebody else might see that word given their experiences in a totally different lens. Um, so I, I start with that, but then the beauty is, is that by, um, is we're trying to automate 
that bias minimization, right? Um, so by bringing in all the results that Google and all the machine learning at Google has told them is the right answer, we can say, we're not even close to the right answer for this word, given everything else that shows up on the page, maybe we should stop bidding on it. So that's our approach to trying to minimize um, our bias because that affects our clients' accounts and our clients are, are, are great people. So they understand that you can't know every single word and all the, and all the different things that it means for millions of, uh, of search terms that they might show up for. But I'm glad that we found a way to not have to accept that as a reality any longer. Great. Um, okay. Yep, Seeing as you more. come, one okay. Um, so I will kick this one over to you. Seeing as you've come from SEO, how do you see long-term keywords being leveraged for paid, and do you see these keywords being a great value add on the paid side? You know what, uh, this is a great question because Audrey is, um, you know, she's just like such a great partner to me on trying to understand the bridges between, you know, because uh, Audrey was very early like, Will, this is great, you're finding a lot of savings, but are there ways we can also find expansion opportunities? Um, so I continue to believe that Google will give us less and less and less data on the SEO side because they're like, you're getting free traffic, we don't owe you squat. But I don't think that Google can be that way when you're paying for each click. So, um, so my thinking is I'm using it mostly to find inefficiencies, but I think that Audrey and the team have found some ways to also find some ways to expand campaigns if you're ready to talk about it today, or if not, maybe we'll have some content out there um, in a bit around how we're trying to use the data the other way to find expansion opportunities. All right, and um, final question for today, and then we have um, information that we can follow up with you all directly if we didn't get to your question and close the loop there. So final question, we just acquired our certification certification from legit script to start advertising on Google for our locations. We only have about a month's worth of data. What would you suggest as a time frame to start this sort of research? Great question, Tristan. Good to hear from you, buddy. Um, I'll be in San Diego in a little bit. Uh, for those on the call still, Tristan's one of our alums. Um, so I'll, be in, I'm, I'm, I'll be in San Diego for two and a half months, so let's make sure we get up. Anyway, now let me answer your question. Um, we're running into this issue right now for a client for whom uh, they basically only build on their brand for a really, really long time. And right now it's taken us about three months to get any data worth a darn um, to actually start to be able to make some, some judgments on. So um, it depends on the client. If you were, um, if you're a business that gets a lot of traffic, you might be able to bid for a week or two and get enough data to start making um, decisions on. But if you don't get a lot of traffic and a lot of searches, it might be a month or two. But what I would tell you to do, Tristan, is work on setting up the joins in your data today because the beauty of Power BI is once you go, now I got six months of data, you just dump in that data and all your visuals will update again. So I'd say spend the next few months working on how to figure out this Power BI thing, watching our videos and whatnot. And then by the time you get ready to, to say, oh, I got that figured out, you might have enough data to dump in if your data is kind of a small data set. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Will, and thanks so much for everybody that participated uh, thanks, in today's everybody. webinar. Expect an email um, in your inboxes later today with all of um, the content and next steps. Have a good afternoon. Peace.